for people who haven't read the article, what happened was we started a list in 2011 of the richest people in Africa, and people kept telling me, you got to look at, you have to include Isabel dos Santos. And uh, the first year that we did it, I don't think she was on the list. I, we couldn't find very many assets. And uh, so then I started digging deeper and uh, calling sources and er, trying to get ideas for who could help figure out what she owned. And people kept pointing me to Raphael. So I first came into contact with him as a source for trying to figure out how yes. much Isabel dos Santos was worth. She's the oldest daughter of the president. And, um, and in talking to him, I realized he was, he knew a lot. Yes. He had collected documents for years from the, the, you know, he had copious amounts of information about how assets had been transferred illegally by her father's government into her name. And so that was how the article came about, um, yeah. that we documented how she got to be worth more than $3 billion. Yes. Uh, so one day I walked into a, an office and I was looking for some basic information. And then I just saw her name uh, in one of the, the records uh, in a company. And then I decided to go to this office every single day and I made it my job. It took me several months just going through all those records for uh, several years. So this was a government records office, yes, essentially? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And finally, when all these stories came out, uh, they burned all the records and digitalized everything. And now one has to ask for information if you know it precisely what information you want. Otherwise, the records are no longer there. But that's why it was an important platform to get this article published on Forbes because it really uh, raised the, um, the profile of Isabel dos Santos, not for the right reasons, but for all the wrong reasons. Uh, and that has helped to increase the discussion around corruption in the country and uh, elsewhere because the article is still being quoted and is still being uh, used as a reference. Uh, just days ago we received um, a phone call from a leading uh, Brazilian magazine that wants, is doing a story on her as well and basically based on what came out in Forbes. Um, You've been thrown in jail by the regime a couple of times, right? Talk, several, several, several times. times. So yeah. talk to us about what, what occasioned uh, those instances. The first time I was uh, interrogated and I had serious problems was during the war, uh, simply because I wrote that... Um, and for, for people here who may not know yes. Angolan history very well, give us a little context on that war. Angola had a civil war for 27 years. And um, it was during the Cold War period, so the United States and the West were supporting a rebel movement, and uh, the, the Soviets and the Cubans, who had a massive presence in Angola, were supporting uh, the communist government, which is the same now, uh, that has just uh, uh, transformed into a kleptocracy. And the first time I was uh, interrogated and um, harassed by the police was essentially because I wrote against uh, the process of conscripting the youth uh, for war. And uh, it was an anti-war piece and uh, I paid for it. And then the second time I wrote that the president was a dictator um, and corrupt and I was thrown in jail for and, that. And where were these pieces published? Uh, there was a sort of independent newspapers, very small independent weekly newspapers too, at the time, that printed no more than 5,000 copies a week. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but uh, it was enough to get one into, into trouble. And how long did they put you in, in jail for? Uh, in solitary confinement for 11 days in a specially Stasi-designed uh, cell. Stasi was the East German... Uh, secret service that had a presence in Angola during this communist period, um, which was an interesting experience because that's the first time I learned about what is human rights and um, what really happens because uh, while I was in jail, I was 
actually locked up as a prisoner of war so that no one would talk to me, not as a journalist. You know, uh, and there were no charges against me, so they could say anything they wanted against me. And then a Lebanese businessman who had uh, swindled $7 million from a, an official at the presidency uh, basically ran that prison. And uh, he was the only one who could speak to me. And he said, you know, we also have war in uh, Lebanon and uh, here we're brothers and talking about as if I were a prisoner of war. <laughs> 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 and then he said, you know, how can I help you? And I said, well, can you take a message out? He said, yes, of course. I said, well, just uh, tell this radio station to this journalist that I'm on a hunger strike. And the reason why I said that was because when I was locked up, the orders were for me not to be fed or be given water. No water? Yes. And the, the cell was just concrete. There was absolutely nothing. Uh, no electricity, no lamps, nothing. It's all dark. Oh, my God. Yes. Um, just concrete. And uh, I could not even lean on the walls because they were very rough. Ugh. So, and uh, he said, but I could help you more. I said, no, you will help a lot. Just said that I'm on a hunger strike. And then the news came out that I was on a hunger strike. And the following day, the head of uh, the prison warden came to talk to me and said, you're a liar. You're not on a hunger strike. We told you, uh, the guards, not to give you food and not to give you water. <laughs> you know? So I said, well, then go and <laughs> you can't tell the press that I'm a liar, <laughs> that I have lied. Said, now you will eat. And by that time, they had learned that I was a vegetarian. So they brought a nice tray with uh, orange juice, um, um, French fries, as you call them here, chips, and um, salad. And I said, no, actually, now I like to be on a hunger strike, and I'll <laughs> be on a hunger strike. And so for 14 <laughs> days, I was on a hunger strike. No liquids or anything? Did you get eventually know? Uh, actually, I had liquids. Uh, that was the most expensive water I have ever drank in my life. You had to pay for it? $1,500. You to had get. to pay for your water in, the, in their jail? Oh, wow. To make sure that uh, my family gave it to, to me directly so that it would not be poisoned. poisoned. Oh, yeah. uh, and then, but it just gives you an idea of how it could be. And, um, and the campaigns also that uh, Isabel uh, and her peers started, and the government itself also helped to fuel the discussions um, because in a way that um, at some point I was portrayed as a CIA agent and a fake American passport oh, was right. posted. Oh, right, I forgot about that, yeah. <laughs> was posted on the internet, but uh, the thing was that the passport uh, stated my profession as a CIA agent. <laughs> 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 it was a badly done. It was uh, a little ID yeah. name. Yeah, it's somebody right. else's name. Yes. Yeah, it was it was badly done. But uh, that in itself was very good because it had everyone reading and uh, commenting, and it actually backfired. It uh, if Isabel expected to get some sympathy from it, uh, it was it the opposite. Work.